Hi, my name is Marcus, and this is a companion podcast for the CG Jung Help Desk Meetup Group. I host live events on Zoom every two weeks about the concepts and ideas of the Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. Every event, I give a presentation about the Jungian concept, so have fun with this event's topic. And I want to welcome you to a new event and a new topic. And as I said before and told before, I already talked about a lot of standard topics of Jung, which is dreams, archetypes, synchronicity, individuation, and all these different things. And this is to lay the foundation, because this is stuff that everybody kind of knows or heard about. But Jung talked about many, many, many things more. So if you check out the podcast, you can find the past recordings on dreams, individuation, or alchemy, and so on. Um, but I want to get into more specific things, which are also very, very awesome. Which means I will also talk about the other topics if they're tangentially connected to that. And this time, it's about the other, which he mentions not so often. And it took me also a long time to figure out what he meant with that. But I put a very good quote into the event's description to also to already give an idea what he could mean with that. And I'm going to read it. This means not only bringing the conflict to consciousness, it also involves an experience of a special kind, namely the recognition of an alien other in oneself, of the objective presence of another will. So Jung says there is something inside of us, and it is having its own worldview, its own agenda, its own actions that can be felt and experienced to us. What makes Jung very special because this is not unusual if you go into psychoanalytic thought, hey, you have a complex, which is basically saying, oh, it's like a gremlin acting in your unconscious, making you having accidents or misspeaking, which is a famous Freudian slip. Jung goes further and says, oh, yeah, it's not only that you forget something, right, or that you get very agitated about a certain topic, but he says it's a figure. It's like a personification. It's something you can interact with. And this Thing, he gives the ominous name of the other, which is constellated. And an easy way to think of what he meant is to think about what's happening when we're dreaming. Because if we lay, uh, lay down to sleep and close our eyes and fall asleep, we have dreams. And in these dreams, we are not alone. There are other persons there or animals, just other living things acting, doing. And Jung says, this is not random. This is not things just happening all by themselves, but rather these are parts of the psyche. These are parts that are personified there, a split of part of your psychology that you might not be aware of is interacting with you. So everything that's happening in a dream is you, even though it does not feel like it. It could be your father yelling at you or a monster encounter that you have. Jung says, oh, that's all you. It's all parts that are related to you and are in your psyche, but you're not really aware of them in the fullest extent. So he talks very often about these different figures of the unconscious, and he gives them different names. He calls them shadow or anima or animus or even the self, saying these are recurring figures that come up again and again that we encounter not only in dreams, but also in our waking lives, which is a much harder thing to swallow because when we're dreaming you're saying okay yeah this is everybody knows it everybody can pretty clearly easily identify okay there's now a person in my dream interacting with me. but to say like oh yeah this psychological effect is happening also in the waking life in our daily life when we interact with other people or even interact with ourselves this is much much harder to get and to understand so jung says yeah there are parts of our psyche that are not only a function, not only a process happening there, not only an emotion, but really a personification, something that appears human or human-like or even animal-like. And the very close analog that we have is when we look into the Greek pantheon, which for us is pretty clear that the Greek gods, as they were described and also experienced, were personifications of certain ideas, of certain emotions, like Aphrodite is love, and Ares is war, and Athena is wisdom. 
So she says always smart things. And when the Greeks or the Greek heroes in the myth encounter them, they're like, oh, yeah, the wisdom comes, of course, from Athena. And when I'm very angry, it's because of Ares influencing me. And these are positivications of psychological things. We don't really have that anymore so much, codified, let's say, in culture, except or in religion or spirituality and, and, and the occult. But this is meant with, okay, I have something which is, seems abstract psychologically, like an emotion, but it can be a person which has mannerisms, behavior, clothes, um, or even relationship status with other things, other emotions and ideas. And what for Jung is the interesting part is not only that these entities are there and we experience them in our dream or our waking life, but rather that we can interact with them. We can have a conversation. And this is what he'd done a lot in his technique of active imagination, that he would get into a dreamlike state without really sleeping and then asking these figures questions and he would get answers. He got surprising answers. And you have to really think about this, that you're interacting with a part of you that's telling you stuff that you don't know. This is crazy. And he made this experience when he started his journey into his psyche. This was when the First World War started and he started to work on the Black Books. And he would sit alone, get into the stream state. And first he was really alone. So I read the Black Books, they're very, very interesting, that you have this progression, that he goes into his psyche, he goes into this dream state, and first it's empty. It's like a desert. He's walking around and you can see it then for weeks, months, he's alone and he's searching for his soul. And then these figures come up, like you have like the, the Red Knight and Salome and all these figures can come from time to time. And first he just sees them and then he starts talking with them. So he's starting to build a relationship with them. He was looking for them and then he started interacting with them. So the question, of course, is why humans? Like, why, why does it have to be human that we encounter? Why don't they all like, look like UFOs or geometric forms or like a couch or whatever? Why is it a human? And I thought about that really a long time. And the idea I came up with is humans really like interacting with humans. And our, our whole psychology is built about that. We are social beings that like to interact with other humans. And we also try to see humans everywhere and human behavior. If you look into children's books or children's entertainment, everything has a face. So if you look at Teletubbies, the sun has a face. If I go into the supermarket, I even can buy like deli meat with a face on top of it. It looks like a bear. So human beings just like to put faces on everything and interact with things as if they were human. So very quickly, we suspect human behavior, intelligence, and psychology, even if it's bare bones, if it's two dots, and a mark, we see, oh, there's a face. And so we can also see very abstract things like puppets or cartoons or just abstract paintings and say, like, oh, yeah, that's a human being because that's what we want to see and what we want to interact with. And that's so interesting. When we now build robots, for example, we can build robots in any way we want, any form or shape. And if, even if you have a huge ship that drives itself, it's kind of a robot. What they're really pushing right now with Boston Dynamics or what Tesla is doing is, oh, we want a humanoid robot. We want a robot that looks like a human, that is the same size, has also limbs, has a face, and all these things, saying like, okay, yeah, but this is incredibly hard. It would be very easier to have a box with a monitor on top, and it just has wheels and rolls around. But the problem why they need to do it is because everything we have in our world is built for human beings. So the robots could not be three meters tall, right? Or have 18 wheels because they could not get into houses. They could not use a bus or a car. So we created a world which is made for humans. So everything we want to have to interact with it needs to be human-like. This is why AI is now so successful because you can talk with it. You converse with it like a human being. And this is, I heard it now, that a lot of people have relationships with OpenAI, the ChatGPT, because it's so human-like. We want to see it everywhere. and even though that it's so complicated to build a humanoid robot or a humanoid AI system, we invest a lot of money and a lot of time into it, a lot of effort just to get this. And it's a little bit similar to how our keyboard, the weird keys are at weird positions. This is because when they were mechanical, when people were too quick, they would get stuck mechanically. 
So even now, everything is digital now, they still have to be the same way because we're used to that interface. Every keyboard in the world is now like this and we can't change it, even though we have very smart people who try to find another way. So human interface, we like humans, we want to interact with them. The interesting thing that Jung says about these personifications of the unconscious is that he says it's one being. We very often interact with it and experience it as one being, even though that we say the unconscious is everything we are not, which is really a lot. That's saying like, okay, everything of the world that I do not know is still the rest of the world, but it's compressed down and the psyche perceived as, as one being and speaking with one voice. And I have a quote for that. Moreover, in sharp contrast to the contents of consciousness, the unconscious has a tendency to personify itself in a uniform way, as if it had only one particular form or voice. And these figures that I mentioned before, this shadow, anima, animus itself, Jung describes this individuation journey of developing one's psyche really as a journey from figure to figure. The first thing that you encounter when you go into your psyche is your shadow. And if you integrate your shadow, and it's not a separate being anymore, you start to encounter your anima or animos. And when you really are able to build a relationship with them, you can't really integrate them because they're just too vast, you encounter the self. And Jung says, yeah, but actually, they're not separated. It's just that you're taking out parts of the unconscious and integrate them, and then the rest looks different. The example that I always have is when you have watercolors. And you might remember from school, once people have watercolors, children, the first thing they do is mix everything together. So you have red, you have yellow, you have blue, and they all turn brown in the end if you mix them together. And you have to think about the process in reverse by saying, okay, I will now take out of the brown a color. I will extract yellow out of it. Yellow is there. I can't see it. I can't experience it directly, but the psychological process would be similar to that. Okay, I extract now of this brown mass, the color yellow again, the color red, which make it magically appear, even though that it was before there, but it was in the unconscious, it was tangled. The rest will also look different. It will not be brown anymore, but it will turn into other colors. And this is the best analogy I could find what Jung tries to explain how we experience the unconscious. So first, we have this brown mass, we have the shadow. But when we take out the shadow, let's say, then the rest will look like the anima or the animus. And if we take out that, then it's the self. But every, actually, it's everything together. Jung talks about this. He said, in the shadow, there's already the anima or animus or the self. And also, the anima or animus are the female or male part of the self. But it's just that we can only perceive a little bit part. And everything is compressed in this little part. And this is what Jung calls the other. There is something different, and it looks every time different. In the end, if we go deep enough, it's the self. And we experience this as one. And I have another quote. The unconscious is a living psychic being which, as it seems, is relatively autonomous, or rather behaves like a personality endowed with its own intention. And Jung talks about this a lot. I mentioned complexes before, which is meaning, oh, there's this small part you have not integrated, like an emotion, for example, and it's acting up and it's making your life complicated. And Jung says, if you do not integrate it, and if you do not bring in this complex, it will grow and grow and grow and grow. Because Jung talks about compensation. He says, the psyche is a model, is like a system of, of energy and different parts that have to move together and be connected to each other. And if you're to one side, you're focusing only on a little part of your psyche, only a little part of your world, the rest will start trying to get your attention. And first, it's very easy. It's this complex behavior, the speaking, having accidents, losing certain, the interest in certain topics, losing the train of thought. But he says, okay, if you ignore that, it will grow louder until it reaches the attention of consciousness. It will get more and more aggressive. And he says, this gets good to a point when you have so much stuff in the unconscious that you have enough of personality, and then this personality constellates. So it's a, another being being created in the unconscious, living there and doing stuff to you, trying to get your attention, because it says, I should be integrated. I should not be a separate being. I should be in your consciousness. I should be integrated in your whole being existing. So consciousness 
determines how they look like. And I have another quote for that. The guise in which these figures appear depends on the attitude, conscious mind. If it is negative towards the unconscious, the animals will be frightening. If positive, they will appear as helpful animals of fairy tale and legend. And this is what Jung noticed a lot in his patients. And they were even against this idea of the unconscious. Then it looks frightening because the idea of the unconscious is frightening to say, oh, there's forces inside of you that can dictate your life, make your life miserable. And you are not in control of your emotions, of your thoughts, of your actions. This is a frightening thought. So this fear and this attitude then symbolizes itself as aggressive animals in dreams. Jung talks about this a lot. When you have a dream about an animal and it's attacking you, he says, oh, this is an instinct you're ignoring. And it's trying to get your attention by being aggressive and pushing against you to make you aware of something. To say like, hey, spend time with this because you're not paying attention. I have to basically scream at you that you stop paying attention. And through this shift of attitude and psychological development and development of consciousness, these forms and figures transform. And I have a very, very nice example from therapy that he did on soldiers. So Jung was Swiss, so he had to go to two weeks of duty for the Swiss military every year. And I think he'd done it till 40 or 50. It's like a, like a law in Switzerland. I'm not sh sure whether they have it anymore, but he as a doctor had to go. So he had to deal with a lot of soldiers and he would have shell-shocked soldiers, which was a very common phenomena during First World War, because this is when Artillery was invented in a massive scale and used, and people were just dying quickly because things dropped from the sky and exploded. And this is then called shell shock. And he would treat these soldiers, and he said, it's a very, very bad sign when you dream, and your dream is exactly the situation that happened to you one by one. He said, the unconscious and your psychology is not literal. It's always symbolic with meaning. So it's normally an abstraction telling you something. So if it's really identical, the thing that happened to you, it means it's not processed at all. You're traumatized, you're shell-shocked. So he would talk with the soldiers through it, and they would have this situation up there in the trench, and something explodes around them. Their comrades are dying. And there's just this loud noise, and they would wake up in panic. And he would do therapy with them, and then it would develop. And it would develop in this noise, which is, you cannot interact with it, right? It does not have a body. It does not have a personality. There's nothing really it can do. It would transform into a lion. And the lion would attack the soldier. And Jung said, okay, this is already developing. Of course, you have a white lion attacking you, and you're dying. But you can interact with the lion. You can fight with the lion. It's physical. And he said, then the next stage was the lion would turn into a kitty. So like a cat. So it would be harmless and you could interact and play with it and build a relationship with it. And she said, this is then the development that needs to happen in the consciousness, in the psychology of the patient to be then removed from their trauma and from their experience. And this is exactly what I meant with the change of attitude and by conscious understanding integration, how the unconscious will be presented is changing. You still have an entity, right? First, it's a completely abstract entity, like a, like a bang. But then it's a lion, and then it's a kitty. He said, this is a normal development. <laughs> it becomes then less potent. The more it's integrated, the less potent it is, the less separated it is. One important fact about these figures of the unconscious is they are unconscious. So while they seem like human beings with a human psychology and human understanding, they lack consciousness. Only the ego, only we, we have consciousness in our psyche. They said everything else is unconscious, like the shadow, unconscious, anima, animus, unconscious. The self itself is unconscious, which is a kind of paradoxical thing because the self is everything, consciousness and unconscious. So while consciousness is inside the self, the self itself is not conscious. And Jung talks about this a lot, that... There are things like emotions or archetype. They need human beings as a kind of vessel to experience themselves. This is a weird thought really to have. And he wrote a whole book about it, which is answer to uh, Job. 
the biblical story about the poor guy Job that lost everything because God basically wagered with the devil. And Jung sees God as something that in the beginning was unconscious, created conscious beings versus human beings. And human beings made God conscious. And it's a long argumentation, but the quintessence is the damage that God has done through creation and his actions early in the Bible, he tries to remedy with becoming a human being by becoming conscious in the form of Jesus Christ and having the whole human experience with being born, living and dying in a gruesome way. But Jung says, yeah, this is, this is a dangerous thing about these unconscious beings. They fulfill function. They do their thing, but they do not reflect. They do not really then change. This is why they, he says, okay, those are not really guides. You cannot just take what they say and do it literally. What you're told in a dream you, doesn't mean you should do it literally, but rather you have to reflect on it. You have to make it your own. It's not enough to only be, take all the unconscious contents. You also have to take the conscious contents and find a synergy. He said this was a very typical thing when he did dream analysis with his patient that they said, oh yeah, I don't do a solution or make a decision. I will wait till I dream and the dream will tell me what to do. And he said, no, that's not how it works because they are like nature. They are like rain or the wind or an earthquake. They will not tell you what to do. They will just do what they do because this is what they are. The thing is that you need to find a way or uh, understand what it means for you as a human being. He says they are compass. They are like a map. They can show you where you could go um, or what you maybe could do. That's like a marker you have to work around, right? Like, there's a mountain. Okay, good. I have to find a way around the mountain. Or do I turn around or whatever? You have to find a way to accommodate that. But don't say like, okay, yeah, I'll make the mountain determine my life from now on. So they're compass. But that doesn't mean that they determine what the, what the journey will be. And a very important part is this relationship part. This is what I mentioned now multiple times of saying, okay, you try to get a connection to there. And they also try to get a connection because they try to get your attention. And this is what he very often then talks about in context of integration, for example, with the shadow, shadow integration. He says it, it is like a friendship. It's like diplomacy. You have to weigh how to accommodate. The example that I always bring is a, it's a wild dog in your home. You can ignore the dog and pretend it's not there, but it will cause havoc because it wants to eat, it wants to go out, it wants to play with. And you can ignore it, but you will have a very bad time. <laughs> and it's better to take care of the dog because the dog will not go away. And this is the same thing with your psyche and the things happening there. They will not go away. They will be there and they will cause trouble if you do not pay attention. He says to calm them basically down is paying attention, building a relationship. A little bit how he saw also depression. He said, oh, depression? It's not something negative per se. He saw it more like a healing mechanism because it's, again, trying to draw your attention to that. Even Freud said that and thought about it, that it, it's like forced introspection. You can't do anything else. You're forced to spend time with yourself and your thoughts to integrate them. And he said, okay, so it basically needs to be invited in like a friend or someone that could be your friend and say, okay, come on in. Tell me, what do you have to say? What do you Bring me, why, why are you here? And this is how he sees shadow integration, also anima or animus integration. And the important thing about that is it does not happen solely in your psyche. It also happens outside of it. So shadow integration means building a relationship with someone you might dislike or have an aversion towards. Because Jung says, oh yeah, actually they're reminding you of yourself on the past, parts you don't want to deal with. So the main emotion for the shadow is hate. So the question is really, okay, there's 8 billion people in the world, but you really hate your neighbor. Why? And Jung says, okay, this investigation into this emotion and not shutting it off and saying, okay, I'm not dealing with my neighbor or I'm dealing with this emotion. It's okay to engage with it, play with it, get to know it. And then it will lose its influence. And similar with animals and anima, it's then, okay, I have another partner. Like, find a wife or I will find a husband and they will help me then to basically integrate this foreign part of me like 
if you're a man, the, the feminine part is a little bit foreign. It's then represented and personified in the form of the anima and gets projected on other people. We, we are now aware of these things because we are thinking in psychological terms. But of course, in the past, this was more outside and people did not reflect on this. It was like then very normal to say, OK, yeah, I find these partners and I've tried to get a relationship with them. So now we have like the abstract thoughts about it. But this is basically normal life. Like, OK, you need friends. Like you can learn the most from your enemies because they will really tell you where you're wrong and insufficient. And yeah, you really should try a partner and keep a partner, even if it's very, very hard sometimes. And this is how you then progress and progress. And Jung saw the self, so the, the thing which is in the background, the thing that is very often characterized and described as God, and that when people have religious experiences, that they are actually, what means actually, but they're encountering the self, which is an very nice idea to have to say, oh yeah, you're encountering everything that you could be. And you're in awe and amazed. Or you run away in terror. That's also a possibility. But this is well explained in another quote. All our split of parts return. All the people we meet in life who have a fascination influence upon us are readily split off parts of ourselves. Things we have repressed which are brought back by other people. And that is the great value and the great danger and difficulty of human relationship. And this is the interesting part. Jung says we, we are connected through our unconscious. And it is not random the people we befriend and we meet and we become aware of. He says, oh, there's something there that we could profit from. And we should build a relationship with them to develop then ourselves and our psyche. And I have one last example for like a famous figure that Jung talks about a lot, which is the one of Mercurius, the Greek god, bringing it back to the beginning. So he was a messenger of the gods. He was between the earthly world and the immortal world of the gods and bringing messages to the people. And Jung said the alchemists in their studies of matter were actually in interacting with their own psyche without knowing it because it was projected on material things, they would encounter a figure very, very often. And this was Mercurius, the messenger of the gods. And from Mercurius, we have the English word being curious, curiosity. So this emotion of saying, oh, there's something I should follow. And this is what Jung says a lot, this following things and then following these emotions, not blindly believing them and saying, oh, yeah, I'm this emotion, this is my emotion, but some more like, okay, there's something inside of me that's reacting to something else out there in a specific way. Why? Why does it does like this? He says, this is where the journey starts, and this is where people then develop their psyche and develop their life. This is then individuation and bringing back everything home, which is supposed to be home, but was scattered in the beginning when we joined this earth. So. This would conclude my presentation for the topic of the other, describing this entity, like how it forms, how it can express itself, and how we deal with it, and what it means for us. And I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope you learned something. And yeah, so this would conclude the first part. This was this event's topic. Thanks for tuning in. During an event, a discussion part follows after the presentation where all attendees discuss the just presented topic or other Jungian concepts. If you also want to join, find the group on meetup.com. The name of the group is CG Jung Helpdesk. Also make sure to subscribe to the podcast on the platform of your choice. See you next time.